All right, everyone, I am here with Sean Taylor. Sean is a staff data scientist at Lyft working on Rideshare Labs. Sean, welcome to the Twimla AI podcast. Thanks, Sam. Happy to be here. Uh, I'm super excited to chat with you. It's been a long time in the works um, and really looking forward to our conversation. Uh, I like to get these interviews started by having you share a bit about your background uh, and introduce yourself to our community. How'd you yeah. get started working in data science? Yeah, thrilled to be here. Um, always fun to like reminisce about how you ended up where you got. <laughs> um, <laughs> I sometimes when I think about the journey to being a data scientist, it goes all the way back to like uh, you know college and working on um, real estate research with a professor I used to work with at Penn um, and getting into like geospatial data there. But I you know th there's a long process since then, um, and probably the most pivotal thing was working in grad school on large-scale experimentations. My, my grad school program, I was studying I was studying to be a social scientist and study how people uh, influence their friends online, really around this era of big data and pe people getting really interested in Hadoop and Hive and running large-scale experiments. And I got uh, I got very lucky and got an internship at Facebook. I was a 30-year-old intern at Facebook, so sort of like, like that movie, The Interns. <laughs> um, and uh, I got a great... Great set of mentors at Facebook, Dean Eccles and, and Eitan Bakshi were, were, were awesome. And they, they taught me everything I needed to know about being a data scientist at Facebook and then decided to, decided to stick around and stay. Um, so I was a data scientist at Facebook for about seven years. Um, and then uh, about two years ago, switched over to Lyft, where I uh, started working on marketplace uh, experimentation and other, other kinds of stuff that Lyft has a very different set of problems than Facebook. But, you know. You can trace that journey all the way back, you know, 20, 20 years if you want to, or, you know, maybe just 10, but it's still still ending up to be a lot of time at this point. <laughs> Feeling old. Nice, nice. Um, so tell us a little bit about uh, Rideshare Labs. What's the what's the mission there? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, for a, for a company like Lyft, there's often things are broken into products and products have a roadmap. So you'll have sort of like we have uh, teams that run certain algorithms like our pricing algorithm or dispatch algorithm, um, ETA prediction, uh, and even the product itself, like the driver side of the app, the rider side of the app. Um, a, a product roadmap has to be very reliable. You have to sort of deliver progress on a certain time schedule um, so that you can meet your business requirements. Uh, but you'd also like to try newer and more innovative things. So carving out some time and space for scientists to work on ideas that might not really pan out. And, and if they were sort of like, if they were, they're big bets, but if, you know, you don't want to bet your whole company on them, so we can kind of incubate them within labs and, you know, try things that, you know, have a maybe under 50% or under 25% hit rate. But when they do hit, we get sort of a big, a big boost out of them. So we, we like to create that space you know, for scientists to do that. Uh, and we have an engineering team as well that helps us implement those ideas and, and get them into practice. And then the, the, the playbook is really to, to get go and then take the thing that we work on and get it into production and then do some kind of handoff uh, to, to a production team that can kind of take the thing that we, that we built and run it in production. Um, so, so we create that space for, for innovation within the company. Nice. And until recently, you had a more of a managerial role on that team, and you uh, kind of swapped jobs. It, it sounds like <laughs> with, with someone to, to get more hands on. I, it, I, I'd love to hear more about the story there, the the motivation. Um, you know, it's not something you see a lot of. Yeah, it, it is an unusual move, and people have asked me quite a bit about it. I, I think it, I was very lucky. So, number one, lucky to get the job in the first place. Uh, so, I, I wasn't sort of um, hired to be head of Rideshare Labs at Lyft, but I, I took the role uh, last summer at, after after a departure with the, the, the current manager of the team. Um, and so, I, I sort of took on this new role of trying to plan research and coordinate research for a large team. We have about 13 people on labs. And uh, it's a very different job, right? So when you you know you're not doing a lot of hands-on science work anymore, you're just sort of helping helping people get unblocked and make sure that they have what they need to be great researchers and to do excellent work. Um, and I, I really enjoyed that. And I think the the mentorship side of things and where you get to see people really thrive and build awesome stuff, and you get to come along for the ride with what they're doing. Uh, but I, you know, I, I had the itch to just do some more hands-on work myself, and I think it's really hard to scratch that itch. From a managerial role, your, your time gets real. There's a you know the Paul Graham essay, the, the maker schedule and the manager schedule. It's yeah. very very true. Uh, you get a lot of your time just sort of like 
eaten up by things that are are they're, are really great, but they don't allow you to accumulate um, progress on projects. So I got very lucky that there's this guy Nick Chalmendy, who's a really excellent manager at Lyft. He's been there a long time, and and he was willing to kind of step in and take on the director role. And he's uh, he took on a lot of my management responsibility, and now I, I have a little bit of space to <laughs> go and work on some of those ideas that have been kind of piling up in my brain for the last few months. That's awesome. Is there any particular uh, experience in your background or um, example that kind of gave you the, I don't know, courage for lack of a better word to kind of make that, that leap to, well, first to know exactly what it was that you wanted and, and second to make it happen? Well, I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm a big experimentation person and I, uh, I think that that's a really important part of my philosophy, both in business and in life. So tr- trying new things is really important. You, you'll never learn if you if you like something unless you try it. It's like same 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 thing with foods as, as it is with careers. So you have to you have to experiment a little bit. So I have a bias toward action and you know trying new things. Um, so that was one part of it. The other part was just having like a supportive company that would help facilitate something like that. So uh, it, I think in general it's pretty tough to to shed responsibility. At a big company, it's uh, it's pretty tough to find people that really want to take on stuff that you've been doing and that the unglamorous stuff, so that you can go and do the fun stuff. But I was lucky to be able to fill that gap. Um, and so, yeah, th- those two things combined my, the experimental mindset and the, and also the thing that's been coming to mind a lot lately is there's this book called Flow. I talk to people about it all the time. Mm-hmm. I think getting into a flow state is like really like something that you should you should try to make your work facilitate. And so I really want to get back to doing stuff where I kind of like lose track of time and uh, are able to kind of like make big progress on, on projects in, with, with a little bit of time and space. So creating that space for myself became a big, big priority. Yeah. At the risk of turning this into a productivity podcast, <laughs> and like learning podcast, um, I'm curious if you've also read Deep Work and how you compare flow and deep work. Oh no, I haven't. I haven't read Deep Work yet. I, I have another Cal Newport book, the you know what is it, the End of Email or Death of Email uh-huh. that I've, I've been kind of paging through, and I, I love all these ideas. I do think that we've we've really kind of made a very distraction filled environment for ourselves as yeah. workers, um, and and it's particularly for the kind of work that we that we do in data science, it really requires kind of sustained attention. Um, so some problems you just you really can't make any progress on unless you can make the space both both in terms of time and mental space for them. So it's it's a big it's a big goal for me personally. It's a big goal for me as a manager when I manage people to make sure that they have that space. I, I even go through that. There's like these preconditions for flow state in the you know in the flow book, and you can kind of apply that as a management philosophy. Like are are the people on my team able to get into a flow state? What kind of distractions are blocking them from making progress and doing that. So I think it's just like a, a really important part of being an effective uh, scientist and, and researcher. Nice, nice. Uh, so you mentioned experimentation and how core that is to your philosophy. Um, I think anyone who follows you on Twitter and and folks should, you know, knows that you're very excited about stats and you have maybe more of a stats oriented, experimentational oriented bent uh, than other some other folks in the ML, uh, at least the ML Twitter sphere. Uh, I'd love to hear you riff on kind of your uh, on that orientation and how you think about the relationship between you know stats and your work and ML and AI. Yeah, that's a that's a great question to reflect on. Um, I I have kind of branded myself as a statistician, and I like hanging out with the statisticians. Because there's a really like uh, old lineage of ideas there to to kind of lean on um, all the way back to like you know Fisher and you know his work on experimentation um, and then you have sort of like Savage is one of the original uh, statisticians and when he was thinking about statistics he was thinking about decision problems at its core so how do we how do we make more effective decisions how do how do we as humans make decisions optimally how would we as a business or someone working in agriculture in the case of Fisher make better decisions. And I really like that pragmatism of statistics, sort of like geared toward a particular application um, and having some uh, some real world problem that you really want to solve. And that, that's sort of like the way that I think about uh, AI and machine learning and statistics. They are tools that we use to, to make something work better, you know, achieve some new capability. And that there's a long tradition in statistics of that. Um, 
doesn't mean that I'm like a really rigorous statistician. In fact, I think I'm not really good enough at math to be one of them. But but there's a lot of great ideas to be borrowed from from that old tradition that, that are we're, we're constantly reinventing um, and that we don't really need to. You can go back and read these old papers, and they have all the same all the same wisdom in, in them that you can read about today. It's just maybe. Maybe we call the methods different things and they're more flexible and more scalable and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, we're really trying to solve pretty similar problems to, to stuff that people have been trying to solve for hundreds of years. Nice, nice. Um, I'd love to jump into some of the things that you're working on there at Lyft. I know one of the things that you are involved in is the forecasting effort there. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I I, I continue to be branded as a forecasting person. Just, you, you know, you write one lousy forecasting package and everybody <laughs> wants you to work on forecasting <laughs> forever. Uh, but it, it is a really interesting problem because I, I think forecasting is, is at its core is a really human centered uh, modeling problem because they're often consumed by humans or people look at forecasts, they have some intuition for what they should look like and they really want to use them to make better decisions. So coming up with a, like a flexible system where the, Ultimately, a forecast has to be a human in the loop decision making system to be effective. Humans have to help inject domain knowledge into forecasts by making them better through what they might know about what's likely to happen in the future. Um, so that's an interesting part to get right. And then using the forecasted you know, information to make a better decision and closing the loop so that uh, and that's another sort of human in the loop piece to it. So at Lyft, what we what we frequently need to do is plan our market management. Um, so there's a supply side to Lyft, which is drivers showing up and using the app to, to provide driver hours to the marketplace. Um, and then we have the demand side, which are people requesting rides. Um, and these two things can get out of balance pretty easily. If we grow driver pool too quickly and we have too many drivers, that could be bad. They wouldn't really earn very much money per hour if, if there were too many drivers on the road. Um, and likewise, like you know, over-demanded situations, we have too much demand and not enough drivers are, are pretty disastrous. If you ever opened up the Lyft app and you've seen like a 25-minute wait time or something like that, it just means that we did a did a bad job at planning how many uh, how many drivers we're going to need. So, we, but we have tools to address the market imbalance and sort of can spend money on incentives on the supply side or the demand side of the market. And so, the forecasts become really pivotal in deciding how we how we do that. Um, so, we have to set these real number policy variables every week and actually every hour. And, and we'd like to be able to plan that in advance um, and, and make plans to do a better job of it. Uh, and so the, the planning really revolves around having a good forecast of our demand and supply state in the future. One of the really interesting bits about demand and supply is that we have control over those variables. So they're not just pure exogenous variables that we'd like to forecast, like the weather. We have to forecast like not only what will happen uh, if we don't do something, but what will happen if we do do something. So if we do something like raise prices, then people will demand uh, fewer lifts. And so demand will go down. And so we have to sort of incorporate the effects of our previous decisions into the forecast. So, so there's there's really like a rich space of modeling problems just within forecasting. And it's really never going to be as simple as just take this line and extrapolate it into the future. And that, that's what's so exciting about it at Lyft. So we really have to, we have to think about a system rather than just like any just a particular model. And when you think about incorporating in the potential decisions that you could make into your forecasts, how do you close that loop? Do you end up using simulation techniques or, or other types of techniques to do that? Yeah, it's uh, at the end, our, our forecasting system is, is designed around causal models. So it's sort of unique in that way. So we think of it as a causal model where we have certain nodes in the graph that we control. So this is a, just like, you know, Anybody who reads Pearl's books will see a DAG and, and think, oh, those are cool, but how do I use them? Well, we do use them at Lyft and we use them to, to model our business. And that the nodes that have no parents on them, the pure parent nodes are, are variables that we control. So things like pr price levels and how much we spend on driver incentives. Um, and then there are nodes that are marketplace outcomes, the so things that like happen. Um, and there are other like, you know, nodes that are pure parents that we don't control. So things like just how many people are good, would show up organically and request rides. So we have to sort of like do this business modeling in advance in order to create these this, this set of models. Um, and they're, they're all linked together as one big structural model. So that's a, that's a pretty exciting thing to do is you kind of couple your forecasts together into a joint system. So they're all internally consistent with one another. So you have sort of like some of those variables are your uh, policy variables and those the forecast for those is actually a plan. So when, you, when you're going to set those for future values, you can't forecast it. It's something that you're going to do. So you're going to fill in this, you know, this vector of values with a plan. And then you say, like, okay, under this plan, what would happen to these other variables? Um, 
the really exciting thing that, that's happening these days is with, with differentiable programming, autograd everywhere means that we can kind of build a model that we can put a plan in and it will tell us what will happen. Or we can also just flip it on its head and say, well, we have an objective, just find me an optimal plan. And that, that's what I'm really excited about these days is that we can, we can take a forecasting model and say like, the, forecast, the purpose of the forecasting model isn't to produce forecasts, it's to produce plans. And those mm-hmm. plans should help make some business objective uh, happen. And so they really like translate directly into something actionable for the business r- rather than something that we'd have to sort of like derive what we're supposed to do based on the forecast. Are you using a particular kind of causal model, uh, causal modeling set of tools uh, that you build these uh, apps in, uh, or are you have you kind of built up your own framework from the the ground up? Yeah, I, I'm lucky to have a team that's very interested in tool building, so they they have built a lot of the technology we needed to do this. But it's 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 built on top of PyTorch, um, and so that that was a kind of inter- interesting design decision we had to make early on, to kind of like. What, what are we going to build the models in? And we wanted something really flexible and that had Autograd built in. So we chose PyTorch. Uh, and we had to build a lot of scaffolding on top of that. So how do the models link together in some holistic system? So we, so we built sort of a way to stitch together a DAG of many models that's composable um, and that can admit sort of like a joint training or training of individual level models. Um, and then on, on the causal side, actually the hard part there is is coming up with old like prior experimental evidence for the causal effects of things so how do we know what the what the effect of a price change will be on demand uh the best way to do that is actually find historical times when we've changed prices and go and try to figure out what happened in in those circumstances because we can't just use the data under no price changes to estimate that so really a lot of the the hard part of the model was finding all the evidence that we needed to estimate the slopes of different curves that are that are kind of like important to the counterfactual predictions that the model makes. So mm-hmm. a lot of a lot of the task of building a model like this is building up business knowledge about what people have done in the past, <laughs> what prior experiments have been run, you know, what interventions have we done historically. And it ends up looking a little bit like macroeconomics. Uh, you know, if you, if you go you go and hang out with macroeconomists for a while, they're obsessed with history because the historical data provides the natural experiments that they need to, to understand what's going to happen in the future. So like when we think about what's going to happen in a recession, what the easiest way to figure out what's going to happen is go find historical recessions and try to see what was common about them. Um, and so we, we apply a kind of a similar lens to that problem. Uh, so I, this question may be... Um... You know, I, I may be asking a question that you just answered, but uh, when you think about applying causal models into the types of forecasting that you're doing, I'm imagining that you have to dramatically kind of simplify the the model, and yes. you know it can't be you know so robust that it's taking into effect all of the actual causal relationships in the thing that you're actually modeling. Uh, and so I'm wondering, like the interface. Um, I guess the thing that I'm thinking of is like leaky abstractions. Like, yeah. do you, you know, how does that, um, how does that manifest in trying to use causal models in a, a real world scenario like this? Yeah, I, I love that question um, because I think it's the it's the hard part, and <laughs> it's. But I've been telling my team for we've been working on this for about two years now is that we're not building a model. We're we're building. A, an evol- a system for building models that's going to evolve mm-hmm. over time to help us, like you know, make agile adjustments to the way the business runs or to, or as you know, as we have new information. So really we don't, our goal isn't to build like the best model in the world. Our our goal is to be agile and to create sort of a modeling framework that allows us to, to get good at making models better, Um, which is really kind of the goal of, I, I think most teams that are building models really are thinking a lot about this loop of like proposing new idea, testing it very quickly, and then folding in the things that work well, you know, into your system quickly. Um, and so we, we really would like to get good at that. So the, the core piece of that is uh, model model checking or, you know, Bayesian's, Bayesian's call it like model checking procedures um, or uh, and uh, validating a model and saying whether it's better or worse than your old one is really probably the hardest part of, of being a machine learning researcher or a statistician in general. It's like when, when do you have a model that's better than your old one? Uh, it turns out for our models, since they're so much based on business knowledge, that really that's a that's a piece where the human in the loop is very useful. People can inspect the output of the model and say, like, this doesn't make sense to me. And that's that's actually very useful information. 
So what we're really trying to think hard about right now is what visualizations and plots and diagnostics can we create very quickly from fitted models that we can show to people that maybe don't even know how the model works or how it's fit, but, but that they can understand and say, like, this doesn't look realistic to me. Um, and that's that's important not only to improve the model, but also because that building trust with those people who like ultimately are responsible for the decisions that the model makes uh, is is sort of like for, of first order importance. If they don't if they don't trust the model, they don't believe it, then they won't. They'll sort of ignore it and not make decisions using it. So um, one of the big pillars for our team for a long time we called it trust and understanding. Like, do you do you, do people trust this model enough to start betting money on it? Is really where we'd like to get. And to get them there, you really need to show them a lot of plots. It's kind of kind of the, the takeaway there. And we've had to be very agile and modify the model a lot. So it's sort of like uh, become, this, it feels, it can feel Sisyphusian if you think of it as like, oh, there's some ultimate, ultimate goal. But really at the end of the day, you're trying to build a good process. Um, and that's, that's what we've been focused on. Uh, in theory, uh, using causal modeling techniques should provide a level of trust or understanding kind of, you know, built in or, or, you know, that's what's written on the tin. That's what a lot of people are excited about causal models for nowadays. Um, it sounds like, you know, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done, though. I think that the hardest part isn't the modeling and fitting models. It's, it's actually like quite easy and straightforward to do that. Uh, what you're really rate limited by is how many interventions that you've had historically. So this, this is sort of like why macro, macroeconomics is hard. It's like, what's going to happen in a recession? Well, we've only had like, you know, three or four recessions in the last 30, 40 years. So there's not a lot of like examples to draw on. So your, your sample size is very limited for interventional data inherently, especially like, you know, system-wide interventional data. Um, now, when you zoom into like, you know, individual level policies, like a user user level randomization at an experiment, or, or uh, we do like time split randomizations at the, like, th those are cases where you can get very precise causal knowledge. You can estimate effects very precisely. But for these like system level um, estimates, it, you really are sort of limited by the available history that you have and what you've done in the past. If, if you've been very experimental in the past and tried a lot of things, maybe you have, you know, the ability to get some more traction on the problem. But uh, but yeah, we, we need to become better experiment designers and, and ultimately be more experimental to make causal models better. And do you use causal models uh, more broadly than in forecasting there? <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I, I think every model is a causal model, but <laughs> that's a very, it should, or maybe they should be. At least it's a very strong perspective, but in, in a business setting, you're almost always trying to make a decision differently. And if you don't make a decision differently, then you didn't really have any any effect on the business. So, uh, so mo models are ultimately meant to sort of drive some decision making, either a very micro level decision, like for us, which which uh, which driver will we dispatch to you as a rider, given that you request a ride, um, is a is a decision that we make. And there are counterfactuals around that decision. Well, we could have dispatched this other driver or this other driver. We have, or we could just not dispatch a driver at all because we don't have enough of them and we need to allocate them in a scarce way. Um, those are all causal questions. Um, and so that's a very micro level decision. And then I was talking about like zoomed out macro level decisions about you know spending money at like a weekly level of granularity on some incentives. They're, they're both causal questions and they ultimately kind of like either it's an automated system that's going to do these things on an ongoing basis without a human in the loop or it's a more sort of like fuzzy business process where there's some human in the loop. But e either way, you sort of like would like to know what would happen if you did something differently. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So you're also involved in efforts around marketplace experimentation there. Can you tell us a little bit about those? Sure. Yeah, that's a that's a, one of the most interesting and challenging parts of a marketplace like Lyft is that uh, it's very difficult to know when you're, you know, when your business is functioning better um, because um, like if you look at something like revenue for Lyft, it's affected by both supply and demand. So we can have demand shocks that make us like a ton of revenue. We didn't do anything to cause that. Um, or we can, you know, drivers, we can, drivers can show up in droves and we can have lots of drivers and everybody gets good experiences. And we didn't, we didn't have any control over that could just be like, you know, macroeconomic factors. So, but ultimately like our business is the business of matching those things. So can we match supply and demand effectively um, and make really, really good micro decisions that add up to good experiences for the participants on both sides of the marketplace. And it's very difficult to know when you're doing a better job of that because there's just all this noise. Um, and so the, the thing that we can do to improve the decision-making there is to build better models of how the marketplace functions that uh, allow us to kind of like uh, partial out the noise, like denoise the signal <laughs> 
that's been, that's being kind of transmitted. So ultimately, what we want to do is try new algorithms in production, so try new ways of matching riders to drivers, and then be able to, de to detect if that's a better outcome for the marketplace or not. Um, and so the way that we try things is through what we call time split tests. So we'll sort of switch algorithms. Other people in the industry call these switchback tests, um, where you sort of switch algorithms on and off at random intervals and try to see what happens on the borderline. So when we switch from one to the other, you get this little, this nice little experiment of like the system just changes state and, um, and it can do better in the next hour than it did in the prior hour. And our, our job as statisticians is to be good at detecting that. So how can we figure out if it really was better? And it's the idea of doing the switchback tests as opposed to the more traditional uh, kind of A-B tests um, that, uh, or sequential testing that you really, the, the granularity of distribution shifts is so small, you kind of have to do them uh, very quickly and, and kind of in parallel. Yeah, I think that's uh, it's it's slightly more complicated in that we have the problem of interference. Um, so it's it's not just the granularity of the intervention. It's that if we if we gave fifty percent of users like a big discount, um, then they would soak up all the drivers, and then these other users who are in the other condition would have fewer drivers available. So there are all these spillovers in marketplaces that cause the treatment that you've applied to some users or some drivers to spill over to the other ones. So. You think about um, ultimately experimentation is a prediction problem in a way, just trying to predict what would happen in a counterfactual world where everybody, you know, in the whole marketplace was was sort of living in a world with our new algorithms. And the best way to do that is just to do it. <laughs> so, so that's what a time split test kind of acknowledges is that maybe the best way to test something is just to try it out and see. But you, you need to have a rigorous experimental design in order to get protectability there. So, so um, we are working on you know finer grain versions of that where it's a little bit more zoomed in. Maybe we can say circumscribe some time and space and give give treatments in a little bit more of a precise way. But it needs to be more um, coarse than a user level randomization in order to get something like more faithful to what we really care about. And when you talk about uh, experimental design there and, and the need to be rigorous there, is that something that is um, kind of human in a loop hand done for every new experiment or have you kind of platformized some of this so that um, you can kind of do some of that in an automated way? Yeah, these are, these are great questions, Sam. I wish it, it almost sounds like I wrote these. <laughs> um, I, I think uh, like one of my big philosophies is that we should be, always be running more experiments than we are. And I, I tell people that all the time, we're not running enough experiments, we should be running more of them. And you think about what, what are the bottlenecks to running experiments? It, it really is, the, hu the human is the bottleneck because we need humans to set them up and plan them. And then we need humans to analyze them and decide what to do. <laughs> and... Um, and you can cut the human out of the loop for both of those steps if you really want to, but it's hard. Um, on the planning side, um, it, it involves sort of making experiments into changes in configuration instead of code. So a typical A-B test is like an engineer writes some new code and you have some like if statement and you know in the code that changes. Um, that's something that an engineer has to set up in order for it to be something that you can test. But if you if you create um, a configuration based system, which which is sort of more common at Facebook than it is at Lyft, but it's sort of like you know engineers like to switch things into configuration when they can. Then all the parameters in your configuration file are just are experiments waiting to happen. They're they're just numbers or uh, or categorical variables that you'd like to maybe try out sometime. Um, so it's possible to generate ideas for experiments uh, using machine learning and Bayesian optimization is one approach for doing this where you sort of like would like to try out parameters that you are most uncertain about how they'll perform in, in an online test. Um, then to close the loop on the other side, how do you get a machine to decide whether you should launch an experiment or not? <laughs> Mm -hmm. And th this is also a huge bottleneck. And I think ultimately it boils down to that. It's very difficult to get people to agree on what the objective of tests are in general. So like what, what, would, what would success look like? And is there, is there just like one variable that we could use to decide whether this is successful or not? And it turns out that the answer is often not. Um, people have, there's usually some trade-offs involved. More of one thing is good, more of another thing is good, but they sort of like, you know, more of one thing makes the other thing go down. Um, and at Lyft, we have like a very clear set of trade-offs. There's usually like a you know things that improve the driver side of the market or the rider side of the market. Um, there's things that improve like Lyft's profitability, but not for our riders and drivers. Um, and then there's sort of like a short-term and long-term set of trade-offs, like you know more of a greedy set of outcomes or a long-term set of outcomes. So, but getting folks to agree on like what your 
um, what Ronnie Kohavi, at, uh, formerly at Microsoft and then Airbnb, is like a guru of experimentation, calls an overall valuation criteria. So if you if you have that number and you can compute it for every experiment, then you can really just then the loop loop is closed and the you know the system can propose new experiments and then launch the ones that are good. And that's really what you see with like approaches like multi arm bandits or you know fully full Bayesian optimization type approaches. Um, they're they're hard to get right, but if you do get them right, then you can run a lot of experiments. <laughs> From the sounds of it, your experimentation metrics are. Uh, at least the ones you've thrown out sound like business metrics as opposed to model metrics. And is has it been easier to uh, to drive business metrics to drive, to drive model development around business metrics with the class of models that you're using with these causal models as opposed to you know deep learning or some other type of technique, or is it just a discipline that? Uh, you as a team have, um, you know, just committed to? Uh, the forecasting and planning side really resists experimentation in a lot of ways. So th those models are hard to evaluate offline and they're hard to evaluate online. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, and we, we do have approaches for doing that. And we do, we do things like, you know, simulate simulated back tests and things like that to try to see if the performance the predictive performance of the model, the statistical performance of the model translates into, into better decisions. Um, and, and we have ways of doing that. And I think it sort of makes the model more faithful to the goal that it was originally designed for. Um, I, I think that, you know, we would love to have much fancier models with better architectures and more bells and whistles. I don't want to engage in like, you know, building fancier models just for fancier models. I'd like to do it in purpose of a specific task. So until until you're very, very good at translating some offline performance metric into some online performance metric, I think it's kind of dangerous to focus only on offline metrics. Um, so ach achieving that concordance between like, I know that my way of evaluating the model offline translates into, you know, better business value. Once you have that feedback loop like tight, then I think it's like, okay, let's do a total free for all on the modeling. Um, this, this is a, a little bit of a different perspective than I think a lot of people propose because they, they, they want to they gravitate toward these offline metrics that can be measured very precisely um, and get really excited about improving them. But I, I think the, the burden of proof is on you as a as a scientist to like to show that that translates into some value um, in, in a way that like other people believe and not just like that is consistent with your model. With the marketplace experimentation, um one of your inputs or a couple of your inputs, I would imagine, are the forecasts, the forecasted supply and demand that go into the marketplace. Are, are there particular challenges associated with um, kind of hierarchical models in that kind of environment? Yeah, I think like Lyft's data is is really fascinating in its structure, and it has a lot of structure that re like re really resists um, efficient modeling a lot of the time. Um, so we have sort of like like a Spatiotemporal process. Let's take demand for instance, and I think it's a it's pretty illustrative of the problems that we have. D demand is a point process. So people pick up an app and make a request for a ride, or just check the price. And so we have a sort of like latitude and a longitude and a timestamp, and that's a unit of of demand. Now, let, let, let's say we wanted to forecast that. Um, there's a lot of different ways to do it. The, the simplest one and the one that's most common is to is to like aggregate it into counts in some time and space. Uh, buckets and then you know use a traditional time series model, but you might also reasonably think about that as like I would just like to be able to predict the density or like the rate of arrival of these points in time and space, and, th and then I could like aggregate up the forecast to whatever level that I want. Um, and so there's this like uh, bias variance trade off of this this whole spectrum of methods, like you know bu bucketing. How do you choose your buckets? So if we choose time buckets or uh, space buckets in various ways, and we get different bias variance trade-offs. If you use a regular grid on lift data, it will work terribly. So there's a, there's a temptation to do things like image image type models where you have like pixels. Most of those pixels are empty, and so you're just sort of like using a very wasteful representation of the data. So uh, and then same same thing for time. Like there's like many hours through the middle of the night where there's just not a lot of activity in the marketplace. So there's a lot of zeros, and so you know your model is not really able to do much with that. Um, so ideally, we'd have a, a forecasting system that can give consistent forecasts at all levels of granularity. That, like if I if I forecast at a very fine level and I add it up, then I would get something the same as if I did the the very high level forecast. Um, 
still a very uh, open-ended research problem for us. I think we're still trying to get this right. But uh, that, that degree of coordination would be really excellent for us because it would allow us sort of like the micro level marketplace algorithms to be making their decisions based on the same information that we're using for more macro level decisions and have those two things be consistent. So I hope that we can get there someday, but it, it really is sort of a challenging uh, kind of like uh, modeling problem because it has this multi-resolution quality to it in both time and space. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. A moment ago, you alluded to kind of the tension between simple models and more complex models. Uh, you are doing some experimentation with neural networks for fine-grained decision-making. Can you tell us a little bit about those efforts? Yeah, I think um, there's a really rich tradition at Lyft of using um, tools like LightGBM or XGBoost to, to solve uh, solve problems because th those are like really great hammers to hit data with. It's sort of like they always, they work very well without a lot of parameter tuning and they work really reliably in production. Um, and so there's there's been a gradual sort of process of, of trying to figure out like could, could neural networks help us and could they do better? Um, and I think the answer has been that they typically don't do that much better in predictive performance than, than tree-based models. Sort of like we might get something that might be a little bit better, but maybe not worth all the extra headache of changing things. Mm -hmm. But the neural networks have a couple of uh, really big advantages. Uh, and a big one is flexibility. So we can change the loss function on a neural network very easily to, to be something else. So like the link, the link function at the end, we can make it so it's going to predict count variables. So it could be like you know, it's very easy to swap in different loss functions. Um, you can do that with trees too, but it's it's more challenging. Um, another one is to predict multiple outcomes at the same time. So like a ride request could turn into many different outcomes. It could turn into, the rider could cancel, the driver could cancel. Um, it can turn into, it can turn into a ride, it could turn into a report. Maybe we want to build a model that pulls all those outcomes into a single vector valued outcome. And then we can kind of, you know, build a shared representation that helps us leverage like, you know, uh, it's like a transfer learning idea. Some of those outcomes are sparser than others. And so by pulling them into the same model, we can do better. Um, that's a very natural idea in neural networks that's, for, that's actually quite difficult to implement in, in tree-based models. Um, and then the other kind of hidden advantage of neural networks is this, the scalability. They actually train a lot faster and we can do much larger scale than we can with trees. And so I think the hope is that we'll be able to eventually sort of like, you know, train models that for our entire marketplace in, in one model, rather than having like region specific models. And that would be facilitated through the ability to kind of like put, put everything into the same modeling architecture all at once. So I, I'm very excited about that future. Um, and we're, we're on our way there. We're already seeing really promising results, uh, particularly for things like heterogeneous treatment effect models, um, where it's sort of like there, there's just some newer technology that allows us to do that. And well, an um, example of a heterogeneous treatment effect model? Yeah, great question. It's sort of like, uh, <laughs> you know, this is causal inference jargon that I take for granted. Um, so uh, in causal inference, everybody's concerned with treatment effects. It's like a single binary treatment would be like, you know, you take a pill and does it work or not? It would be the average treatment effect would be average over the population. Heterogeneous treatment effect says, hey, hey, maybe that pill works better for some people than for others. And we like the machine learning model to give us some ident uh, idea for whom it will have stronger treatment effects. Um, and if you think about this as a labeled data problem, it doesn't work because I would like, you know, to take, you know, a, a vector for you and predict, uh, a, an effect and I'll never observe you getting the treatment and not getting the treatment. So I can't actually estimate a per, you know, per observation treatment effects. Um, and so you have to use a kind of interesting architecture to, to do that. Uh, but then once you do, you get this very powerful model that sort of uses all the available features to try to explain uh, heterogeneity in the response to the treatments that you have. So treatments for us might be things like coupons or discounts for riders um, or incentives for drivers. And so by kind of like putting those into models and letting the models tell us about the, you know, how the response to that treatment might vary, um, we can do a better job of figuring out like which, which people are going to benefit the most from different treatments that we can use. Nice. It sounds in some ways analogous to the idea of getting the plan out of your forecasting models instead of the forecast itself. Yeah, I, I do think that that's, uh, that's a big theme of my last couple of years is thinking about models as not returning predictions, but as returning decisions. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it creates a sort of like end to end way of thinking about machine learning is like really like the part in the middle where you have an estimate or a prediction is, is a nuisance to the system, right? Like, a, you know, automated system doesn't need to know that there was like some estimate of something. It just needs to know, like, what am I supposed to do in the code? Who am I supposed to give this treatment to or which rider is supposed to be matched with which driver? Uh, doesn't care about you know some estimate that happened along the way, and 
uh, I don't know if we'll get there anytime soon, but really the, the layer of human interpretability within these models is a little bit of like a, something that we just have as like vestigially for a little while until maybe we'll end up with like some more end to end systems in the long run. Nice. Nice. Uh, I'd love to close this out by having you talk a little bit about the role of rideshare labs relative to kind of classical lift data science, you know, just listening to you speak, it sounds like a lot of the stuff that you're doing is kind of practical today work that's you know, <laughs> impacting the short term of the business as opposed to your traditional labs, which is, you know, pursuing these moonshots that may or may not materialize. How do you think about that relationship? Yeah, that's a, I, lo- I love that question. Um, I, it is a, these are moonshots. The, the problems themselves are the same as the the teams themselves that are working on them. And we, we partner with them quite closely. Uh, so we're always working with teams that are actually doing real real work and working on actual day-to-day problems. So we have this kind of collaborative model. But the moonshot part of it is that the, we're, not, we're not sure that the methods for solving those problems are going to work yet. So we have a known working solution that we can pursue sort of like small gradient steps toward improving. Um, but if we want to take a jump in design space to a different solution, um, then we need to incubate that somehow. So that, like the move from trees to neural networks for these systems is something that you know takes months to implement. And it's not something that a product team really would, would, would probably ever prioritize because it would just detract from getting some more immediate business value. So I think the problems stay the same. What we're trying to do is kind of like mine the field for new new solutions and think you know things like going to conferences and reading reading all the latest research and saying, hey, hey, how does this apply to our business? Is there an idea here that like really could be a big step function improvement in how we do things? And and if it if it if it could be that, then it's our job to be experimental and try those things out in a kind of like limited risk setting. And so that's that's kind of my my big idea about what the role of a labs team would be. Awesome. And is there is there a, a result from a conference or a paper or something like that that stands out as an example of that? You know, something that. Um, you know, it was from another area or, or kind of orthogonal to what you're currently doing, but um, you had really interesting results trying to apply it. Yeah, I mean, the, that heterogeneous Truman effect modeling idea, I didn't come up with that. We, I mean, it's like, what is it? Great artists copy, or good artists copy, great artists steal. Yeah. <laughs> it's the same thing with scientists. Uh, that's uh, Claudia Shi and Victor Veitch and David Bly had this paper. It's called Dragon Net. And so you can go and read that paper. And it's got a really great idea for a neural network architecture that can estimate heterogeneous treatment effects. And I saw the paper and you can see the, the diagram for the neural network architecture. And we're like, wow, this is a great, it's a great idea. They already had code available online. So we can go and like, you know, try that out on our data. And that's been sort of like an ongoing process of trying to figure out if we can, if we can do better than our kind of existing methodology and when and where it works better. So, um, yeah, so I think we, we borrow very liberally. And I think that that's actually the really fun part right now. It's everybody's inventing all kinds of new stuff. So it's fun to, it's fun to be someone who borrows and steals. <laughs> awesome. Well, Sean, thanks so much for taking the time to share a bit about what you're up to. It's been wonderful catching up with you. Yeah, thanks, Sam, for having me. This is this is super fun. Great questions. Looking forward to the next time. Thank you. All right. See ya. All right, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that interview. I am here with my friend Robert Osazuanes, and we're going to spend a few minutes chatting about the interview and how it relates to his causal modeling and machine learning course. Robert, welcome back. Hey, Sam. Thanks for having me again. Hey, why don't we just get started by having you um, just kind of riff on the interview and how it ties into the the themes that you've covered in the course. We've been doing the kind of joint uh, altdeep.ai, that's your uh, education company in Twimmel collaboration for about a year and a half now, uh, what, maybe four or so cohorts so far? Yeah, it's been a good collaboration, you and I. And I enjoyed the interview. Uh, Sean is somebody we, we go a ways back. I think I first met him when I was running a meetup on probabilistic programming back in the Bay Area. And he came and talked about Profit, which was the, uh, the forecasting software he built on top of uh, probabilistic programming language called Stan. Nice. And so did any particular themes jump out at you from the interview? I think you prepared some clips that you wanted to, uh, yeah, to talk about. Took some snippets here. You know, it's funny. You know, I've had at these. It's actually tangential to some conversations I've had recently. He talks about. So one of the approaches that we focus on in our course is a 
is a generative modeling approach to uh, causal modeling. And, mm -hmm. and, and some of those themes came up here. And so, for example, he talks about heterogeneous treatment effects. Heterogeneous treatment effects says, hey, hey, maybe that pill works better for some people than for others. And we like the machine learning model to give us some idea for whom it will have stronger treatment effects. And if you think about this as a labeled data problem, it doesn't work because I would like to take a vector for you and predict an effect. And I'll never observe you getting the treatment and not getting the treatment. So I can't actually estimate a per, per observation treatment effects. Yeah. So one interesting thing, if you take a generative modeling approach to causal modeling. So what you're doing is you're, you're modeling the distribution of the causal query. So say you want to know what the causal effect is of this treatment on that outcome. You're looking at the distribution of that outcome under the intervention, under, under the treatment. And, and so from a generative modeling approach, since you're just directly modeling the distribution, heterogeneity is built in. Right, it's a distribution, and so it's spread quantifies uncertainty. It quantifies the diversity of a population, and so if you want to then take, so what that allows you to do is take modern probabilistic modeling tools, uh, many of which are using cutting edge deep learning auto differentiation architectures to do inference and just say like, okay, well, I have this distribution. What's the probability distribution of this treatment on this outcome? What's the probability distribution of this treatment on this outcome if this person were over six foot five and um, likes to ride bicycles, right? And so mm -hmm. uh, that's all just, we can, we have modern tools and probabilistic modeling that we can just apply directly to those problems. And, and, and so that's, the approach that we take in the workshop, because many people actually already have some skills in uh, using some of those tools, for example, PyTorch. Uh, but there's also one of the things that popped out to me in this interview was kind of talking about the joy of modeling. And that's something that really resonates with me. You guys had a conversation about flow state. I talk to people about it all the time. I think getting into a flow state is really something that you should try to make your work facilitate. And so I really want to get back to doing stuff where I lose track of time and are able to make big progress on projects in, with a little bit of time and space. You know, I could think kind of back in my career as a statistician, data scientist, machine learning engineer, right, where I learned some technical skill and it dramatically improved just my experience at work. Uh, say, for example, I learned a little bit of functional programming, how to apply it, apply it to exploratory mm -hmm. Data analysis, I learned uh, probabilistic programming and how you can compose smaller programs into bigger programs using some ideas from category theory to, to model complex systems. And it was great. You can solve new problems. And, uh, you know, more importantly, I think for me personally, more importantly, was that aside from the productivity gains and the ability to do new things, it was just funner, right? Like I was able to get into that flow state um, you know, there's other sources of joy, right? Ecstatic bliss, Fiero. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't care about those. Like, I, guess I really care about just getting into a deep work type of mindset and being able to do cool things with, with my data, with cool tech. And, um, and know, is the idea that causal modeling provided some of that for you? The approach that we're working on in this workshop does, right? So a lot of causal modeling, if you go to the textbooks, it's just like, um, you know, let's construct an, esti uh, an estimator for this identifiable estimate. And there's a whole bunch of theory and math and, and it doesn't really, you know, it's almost as though you have to learn a new degree just to, just to be able to apply these methods when if you can uh, take some of these concepts from generative modeling, from probabilistic programming, from, you know, in some cases, uh, functional programming and, and connect it to your intuition and understand how bits of a causal model can compose together like programs. It actually makes it, uh, well, frankly, much funner than other ways of, of, of going about it. It also makes it easier to learn and it makes it easier to apply. Uh, and so you know, that was one of the things I got, I got to thinking about when I listened to this interview with Sean. Nice. Nice. Yeah. I've often found it interesting when folks ask you, what are the prerequisites for the course? And you reply, well, some basic probability, but uh, it's not like you need to have, you know, some deep theoretical grounding in causal causal modeling or causality or uh, stat statistics or anything like that. 
Yeah. And, and obviously those things would help you if you wanted to apply it to a specific applied problem where, you know, say you're working with some variable that's, that has a lot of nuance and, and uh, the, in terms of statistically modeling it, or you need to understand a little bit about say, I don't know, you know, measure theory that that's possible with, mm -hmm. with a specific class of problems, but it's completely separate from the problem of applying a causal model to the problem and reasoning about it causally. Mm -hmm. uh, did you have any other clips that you wanted to share? I don't know. Here's this bit. All, you were talk, guys were talking about leaky abstractions. I think I, I, it, it relates to uh, what we were just discussing in terms of um, reasoning about a causal model as a program that you can uh, build on iteratively and, you know, apply some unit testing to, uh, you know, have an explainable model and kind of build a, a component of that model where one thing is working and then you can move on to another part of your causal model so that you can grow it into something that is um, building value for you and your organization over time. And so I'm wondering like the interface, I guess the thing that I'm thinking of is like leaky abstractions. Like, yeah. do you, you know, how does that, how does that manifest in trying to use causal models in a, a real world scenario like this? Yeah, I, I love that question. I've been telling my team for, we've been working on this for about two years now, is that we're not building a model, we're building a, an evol a system for building models that's gonna evolve mm -hmm. over time to help us like make agile adjustments to the way the business runs or to or as, as we have new information. That resonates with me because two things. Number one, a lot of tools in machine learning and statistics, they kind of encourage you to get really good at learning the tool, they, they, mm -hmm. block box, they black box most of the workflow and you just kind of learn some kind of art of hyperparameter optimization. And with these types of causal models, you need domain knowledge. And, and so you need to get, you, you need to be thinking um, uh, in very detailed ways about the data generating process. And so if you can, if you can take, if you make clear, composable abstractions about that process and focus on some small element of it to start with and then build it up over time. And also uh, the inference algorithm. If you can separate the model from the inference algorithm, you can perhaps use some cutting edge uh, deep learning techniques for probabilistic modeling, say stochastic variational inference. And, uh, and, and you, you learn how to you know, make programmable inference and build that up over time. Not only do you have something that's more robust because you can make sure that each component is working in isolation before you you uh, bring them together, but also something that builds IP over time for your company. And this is a lot different from how causal inference is usually taught because it's usually taught as though uh, the problem that you're presented with at the beginning is the, is the only problem that you're ever going to face. And so if there's a new problem, you have to start from scratch and build a new model. And in a production setting, that's, that's not a good approach. Well, your target participant uh, for the course is someone with a, someone who's t thinking about these problems from an engineering perspective, as opposed to a traditional statistical perspective, whether that's, you know, in the, the kind of sciences or social sciences or, or what have you, which is a lot of where the, where causality has been, uh, been where folks are thinking about causal models and causality. Is that right? Yes. So. You know, you guys had this blurb. And so we have to incorporate the effects of our previous decisions into the forecast. So there's really like a rich space of modeling problems just within forecasting. And it's really never going to be as simple as just take this line and extrapolate it into the future. And we have to think about a system rather than just like any just a particular model. Do you think about incorporating in the potential decisions that you could make into your forecasts? How do you close that loop? Do you end up using simulation techniques or, or other types of techniques to do that? Yeah, it's at the end, our forecasting system is designed around causal models. Right, and so that, at, at least currently, is the killer app for causal modeling in production. In most settings, if you're, do, if you're building some kind of predictive algorithm, it's going to generate a prediction that you are then going to use to make a decision. Mm -hmm. But often, in fact, more than often, the, this, that decision impacts, the outcome of that decision impacts 
the data that your algorithm is going to use to make future decisions. That feedback loop can cause a significant amount of bias to the algorithm. And so, yes, that is the main engineering use case. That said, we have lots of researchers in applied fields who are trying to get a global perspective on causal modeling. Um, uh, many people from public health and many people from economics, for example, who maybe have learned a few specific causal model, causal modeling or causal inference techniques that are popular in their domain, but mm -hmm. don't really have a global understanding for, for the theory. Got it. Got it. Let's maybe switch gears and talk a little bit about the course itself. What's the structure for the course? It is a cohort based course. We have online lectures and videos. We have uh, assignments, programming assignments, and we have a weekly retrospective cohort meeting where we go online and um, talk about that week's lectures, answer questions, maybe workshop some people's individual problems. Um, and, then, and then alongside, we have uh, some reading groups with uh, previous students who are interested in talking about adjacent topics. Uh, and then we have a project-based element to the course such, such that if you're trying to build a project uh, you can you can uh, where you can apply these ideas we'll, we'll provide support with that and you can team up with other members of the of the uh, course to uh, come up with a good project outcome can you mention a couple of projects that uh, students have taken on uh, recently one student used uh, a deep learning technique called normalizing flows to imp implement a counterfactual reasoning algorithm on images. Uh, some other students used, uh, these, these students were fans of uh, soccer, football, and they used, they built a causal model that would predict the outcome of a trade. Other students uh, prior to COVID, uh, this was a really cool project. They used, um, uh, they downloaded, a bunch of Airbnb data, downloaded a bunch of um, real estate data from Redfin, and then composed them into a model that would predict uh, how much, uh, would, basically, if you wanted to buy a, a house with the goal of maximizing revenue from Airbnb, it, uh, it shows you, you know, basically created a search engine for, you know, Airbnb optimal properties. Uh, another, uh, then post COVID, some people did some really interesting things with, um, epidemiological models and adjusting them so that they were, they were using causal reasoning. Nice. Nice. And all of that might sound intimidating to some folks who would be perfect fits for this course in the past. You've uh, made a point to make sure to let people know that they can kind of adjust their, they kind of, you get out of it, what you put into it and you can take it at different levels. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah. So if you, you know, people are busy, a lot of people are full-time employed who are taking the course. And so you, uh, we set it up so that you can move at your own pace. If you miss a week because of work, you can hop onto the cohort and get fairly caught up in the review section of the cohort. Um, you know, obviously if you were going to go deep, do, uh, go deeper into the videos and the homeworks, you'd get more out of it, but you'll not, it, it's set up so that you're never in a position where if you, if life happens, you kind of get left behind the rest of the course and, you know, you won't have the time to, to, uh, to continue. You'll always be able to, um, catch up and, and get, to, and get as much out of the course as you can. Awesome. Awesome. Well, there's a ton more that we can go into. Uh, one of the things that past students have raved about is the access they get to Robert and uh, the one on one guidance that he ma makes himself available to to deliver. Um, but really, the next step is to check out some more information about the course. Uh, and you can do that at twimmelaicom slash causal. Uh, and thanks for tuning in and thank you, Robert, for joining us.